Regardless of whether we consider justice implications of urban climate policy, there always will be some sort of justice impact. It is absolutely inseparable from urban climate policies. And what we're actually seeing now is that a lot of urban climate policies that are proliferating actually end up having uh, negative social impacts. Having said that, there's also a lot of ways that we can ensure that urban climate policy is more just. Uh, and the first step here, uh, as a political scientist, uh, the first thing I want to point out that this is always going to be a political process and the political process is central to the formulation of just urban climate policy. So ensuring that you have different mechanism of including people in the decision making process is, is really uh, the most, we know that that is one of the most important components in shaping justice outcomes. This is not just a matter of saying we have a participatory process, so really thinking about how can we access those voices that are not included is really central to making sure that we have just outcomes. The question immediately arises, who is going to have access to it, who is going to be excluded, uh, and of course this is related to who made the decision to make that investment in the first place. It's very important, for example, now we're facing a, a fuel poverty crisis in, in many parts of the world, including in the UK where I live. Uh, if we're thinking of something like energy insulation, who can actually afford that? How to make sure that people can both afford to heat their houses and also uh, the costs of retrofit, retrofitting their home, for example. Uh, but if we move on to urban adaptation options, I think the first sort of the imaginaries of adaptation actions that most people will first have in their mind is also of a form of investment projects, whether it be, for example, into green space that will ensure permeable surfaces that make sure that water can be absorbed in cases of flooding and so forth, or protective uh, uh, walls against uh, climate hazards like, like floods again. Uh, there we're actually back to the question of who is going to have access to this, who's going to benefit from this, who's going to pay for it, who actually decided that we were going to have that investment in the first place. But actually, probably the most important thing to say here is that if we're going to be investing into urban uh, climate adaptation solutions, there's now a vast literature that shows that the kind of interventions that will really reduce vulnerability will be the ones that are targeting uh, social well-being aspects. In the UK, we, we also know that households that operate, for example, with very low savings or uh, other kinds of social precarity will also be the ones that, are, that have the most difficulty to cope with climate disasters. So we're talking about investments in social, social protection and these kind of broad measures to ensure resilience. In many cases we find projects that have practically no social or ecological component whatsoever and then we end up calling it greenwashing because there's, there seems to be nothing green in there. I think that there are many instances where we can see a form of, of greenwashing happening in all those cases. Uh, the echo concept, for example, popularized through models like the echo city. We know that this has been deployed widely by, for example, consultancy firms and real estate companies that want to invest in glossy, for example, living environments for the rich in cities, clearly using echo here to legitimize that kind of development. Or in the case of the circular economy, this can very easily become a label for uh, industrial clusters, for example, that can just be core, a core part of a city's development economic strategy in the first place. But clearly what we're seeing in all these instances is uh, using uh, a label to promote projects that you had already intended to do in the first place. If we start to look at the actual contents of these plans, we're not going to find that they're completely void of an ecological compo component. You can normally relate it to some sort of uh, environment-friendly lifestyle or some sort of resource-efficient technology. So I guess whether we want to call it greenwashing, I mean, it's a matter of degree. I think the real problem here is that we are using these labels to communicate an intent of some sort of transformative pursuit, where actually these are, these are projects that are really good at continuing investment-driven models of growth cementing business as usual and really we're stuck in the status quo. There has in the past 
decade been an elevation of cities as the champions of global climate action. And when we start to look into that, it is very clear that there are certain cities that are being elevated into these positions and others that are not. For that reason, it's much more likely that you will see uh, cities or representatives of cities like London, Paris, Paris, Tokyo, New York, they will be the ones who are speaking. But there's also something a bit more profound happening here in terms of what are the cities that we're imagining that are leading this action. Because when we start to look into the narratives about um, cities as leading climate change, this becomes associated with a very particular kind of climate action, which often tends to be really sort of glossy, high profile investment and in technology intense projects. It might be like really complicated spatial planning or something that we often would associate with cities that are global city. So we have an imaginary that becomes associated in other cities that are sort of forgotten in this conversation. So the research project that I'm working on right now is explicitly about trying to understand what is happening in what we're calling ordinary cities. So in our case, we've defined that the cities with less than 1 million people that are also rapidly urbanizing, they're concentrating in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And we find that there's a lot of climate action happening there, but something that is never, ever, you know, featuring in the limelight of these international conversations. We know that the emissions within the coming decade are expected to be emitted from infrastructures that are yet to be built. And this infrastructure is going to be built in these cities. That's also an interesting conversation. We have to be quite careful here in terms of thinking about um, capacities of local governments. Sometimes it can make it seem like there's a deficiency among local authorities in some part, parts of the world so that they're not able to do this and that. Um, but if we listen to what the local governments themselves are saying, so again in the conversations that I've had with them, for example, when they're participating at the COP, one of the points that they really raise is we're not going, we don't have the resources to cope with adaptation. In many cases, perhaps even to provide basic services. So when they're hit by a climate hazard, it just becomes absolutely impossible for them to deal with that. Uh, this is what it has become popularized as the adaptation gap. And we do see that it is smaller, uh, small, smaller municipalities, certain parts of the world where the, there will be less financial resources to cope with that kind of problem. Who are we actually putting on the stage when we're putting cities on the stage? When we're talking about, let's say, a city like London or Toronto, for example, most of us tend to imagine the urban area of that city as being represented by one person who's speaking for the city in an international event, for example. That's not normally how the jurisdictional divides in a city operates, though. In many cases, you will not have an individual who can actually speak for the city. And so when we're thinking about climate mitigation or adaptation actions in cities, it often involves a lot of large-scale decisions that frankly would, will be out of bounds for, for city authorities to make. It, it is a little bit of an illusion, I think, that we're thinking uh, of cities acting independently on the world stage. And cities will often be completely aware of this. Uh, they often, in fact, will be participating in, the, in these conversations as a, as a negotiating, strat negotiating strategy to get resources from their own national government, for example, um, visibility or some sort of bargaining power. So meaning that they're always aware that they're operating within this, within a multi-level governance system and, and have created these narratives of cities on the world stage. If we're thinking about some of the sort of planning ideas that are embedded in a model like the 15-minute city, there is an established critiques against, for example, master planning in cities, often because it tends to be uh, top, top down, um, it tends to be a sort of external imposition of solutions that doesn't really uh, take into account what are the needs of the people who live there. Um, in many parts of the world we know that this is uh, included, uh, this sort of tends to contribute to the exclusion of the urban poor, for example. It can destabilize uh, fragile livelihoods that might have existed there in the first place. So there are sensible reasons to be skeptical of models that are linked with that, but we can already see a tendency among uh, within populist uh, politics to 
to really cultivate to cultivate narratives of uncertainty of climate change, for example, that is resurging. You know, like how have how have we not moved past that already? But that that's clearly coming back, and it's becoming quite complex in terms of, for example, how it's being promoted in relation to social justice issues. And I think this is something that we have to take to heart. We can't just pass it off as all being populist, even though populists will capitalize on this. It's, it's a conversation that we, we need to have and also consider to what extent we as researchers are part perhaps of an elite that often live in cities where we're not confronting the same kind of, kinds of problems. That was actually the, what I said there was the thing that I was thinking of in the earlier question, so it Perfect. came back. <laughs>